We're at the 25th Croy. We're here with Sharon Lewin from the Doherty Institute in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, University of Melbourne? Yeah. And we really appreciate you taking the time, as you've done many times for us, because you're really a, a one who has done a lot of collaborations, and so you really have a good feel for the, the whole of, of uh, cure work that's being done, and uh, you always give us a lot of hope. But we have to temper the hope with reality. So uh, it's, we hope we get there. Uh, so do I. And so, uh, so does everybody. Boy, I'll tell you, we've waited a long time. But I think uh, I'm going to let you cover the territory that, since we talked earlier before this, that is probably needing to be covered that is not otherwise being covered by someone else at the conference. Because mm -hmm. we've, we've interviewed a few, and, and I think you probably have some good information that has not been covered yet. Sure. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some interesting studies here that have been on cure. Uh, we haven't had any uh, clinical trials and people that have given us a whole lot of hope recently. Um, we spoke yesterday to my colleague around one study that Thomas. we did in Melbourne, yeah, um, looking at whether we added extra, in, 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 if we added in extra antiviral drugs, mm -hmm. did we change things at all? And mm -hmm. we added in a potent integrase inhibitor, dolutegravir, didn't change anything, which um, perhaps tells us there isn't much virus replication going on. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, collaborating with uh, Afam Okayo and Lewis Picker in Oregon about a different mm -hmm. strategy that we thought we'd test in monkeys first, um, not something that we could do in clinical trials. And what we did was we asked the question that if we just killed off all the CD4 T cells and let them come back, could we get rid of the reservoir? Yes, you're doing it with Lewis Picker. Yeah. yeah, with Lewis and AFAM. Mm -hmm. And so we, we did it initially, we, we, we did this in a monkey model, and that's what we're presenting here. And we used a drug called alamtuzumab, which is an antibody to an, something called CD52 that's expressed in a lot of white blood cells. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's used for treatment of multiple sclerosis and other cancers. So it's actually relatively safe, even though you wipe out someone's T cells and then they slowly come back over about six months. Certainly not something we would do in human studies. We just asked the question in a monkey model whether this would perturb the virus or get rid of the virus. So what the, what the antibody did was it did wipe out all the T cells. We couldn't find any T cells in blood. It didn't do such a good job of wiping out the T cells in tissue, but we've got about 50% reduction as opposed to in blood about 99% reduction waited for all the T cells to come back. Mm -hmm. And we found that the reservoir pretty much looked exactly the same. So um, all of the virus that was there before returned once your T cells came back. And there's two explanations for that. One is that most of the virus is sitting in the tissue, so we didn't wipe it out mm -hmm. like we did in blood. And that's probably quite likely. That's what you would likely. call a compartment of sorts. A compartment yeah. that we couldn't access with this antibody. The other is that when, when you get T cells coming back, they divide a lot to fill up the space again. Mm -hmm. And at, we know now over many, many studies that as these infected cells divide, the virus can divide with them, or what we call proliferation. Mm -hmm. So it may be that we've just got a lot of proliferation of these infected cells. So it's a study that unfortunately didn't work, tested an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Other groups are doing the same sort of thing. Um, very hard to get rid of T cells once they get into tissue. In fact, T cells are designed to home into tissue and stay there. They just hide out. In every they cell just the hide body. out. They're, they're yeah, and actually, they even can change their sort of um, colours a bit once they get into the tissue, mm -hmm. and they're, they're called tissue resident memory or TRM. Mm -hmm. And we know now that those T cells that get into tissue basically get in there and get stuck there for life. Mm -hmm. So that may be, that's going to be a big challenge, getting rid of those cells so they don't come back out again. So um, alamtuzumab didn't work. Um, some other interesting uh, studies that are here, there's a lot of studies on looking at whether CD32 marks an infected cell. I'm not sure whether you've talked about that before, but one of the big questions in HIV cure research is to get a marker for a latently infected cell. Mm -hmm. We can mark it on the inside 
by measuring DNA, but we can't mark a latently infected cell on the outside. And if we had a marker on the outside of the cell, it would open up a whole lot of doors of different things that we could do. Mm -hmm. And last year there was a publication saying that it's something called CD32 was a marker for the, that set on the outside of an infected cell. There's a lot of excitement about that study. But whenever you have one scientific discovery, a whole lot of people try and do the same thing. And what we're learning now from a lot of studies being presented here at Croy is that maybe it's not such a good marker of latently mm -hmm. infected cells. It might just mark productively infected cells, so mark, vir mark cells where the virus is actually producing mm. more copies, not truly latent. Is there anyone test that out to, to determine that? Well, there's been there's about 10 different papers here trying to answer the questions in different ways, looking at CD32 in blood, looking at it in tissue, looking at it in activated cells, looking at it in resting cells. They're all sli asking slightly different questions, but if I had to summarise what the work that's presented here, looks like CD32 sits on an activated T cell. And we've known for a while activated T cells carry HIV. And activated T cells probably carry HIV in people on treatment a bit differently to how resting T cells carry HIV. So in resting T cell, meaning the T cell is not doing anything, it's just sitting there waiting around, hasn't yet been revved up or gone into action the virus is, prob is very quiet and quiescent and latent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in these more activated T cells, which perhaps express CD32 or PD-1 or other markers, the virus is a little bit revved up and actually mm -hmm. producing virus. So I think mm -hmm. that's what we're beginning to learn seeing, about. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think when you, you find a lot more uh, failures, if you will, I hate to call it, because it's a learning experience. And that is the issue. I mean, you, you, every failure, you learn something. Yeah. So it's not really a failure in, the, in the, the grand sense. It'd be great to have a success every time you do, but you learned what doesn't. So are you reporting, are you recording, are you uh, archiving those learning experiences? I know that you don't like to publish a paper that doesn't really have a really great positive outcome, but it's... Well, actually, I think it's really important to publish papers that are, publish mm -hmm. studies that are negative. It's yeah. absolutely critical. Right. There's no doubt that if you look across the scientific literature, there's a lot more positive studies reported than negative studies, right. but still you've got to report those right. negative because studies. Because that way it's an archive. For, and, and you stop people doing something that's not going to work. It's really, right. really important. Otherwise, everybody keeps on doing it and they don't realize that it's been done 35 times Oh, more. yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 we'll, we'll pub both of the studies that were negative are t certainly going to be yeah. published. The yeah. Dolutegravir study will, is about to come, is recently being set to Lancet mm -hmm. HIV, so yeah. that will come out. Um, and the study with alum Tuzumab, we've still got a little bit more to do because we want to understand those infected cells. Were they exactly the same as they were at the beginning or have they changed mm -hmm. after the, we've allowed them to come back? And that's going to tell us a few interesting things about how the virus persists. Now, when you do research in cure, amongst everything else, it's all pretty much the same. When you, when you have a learning experience and you now have new information, and that's why I think sometimes the young investigators are probably, they're more virgin in their thinking. They know what's happened recently, but is it with that other information that keeps coming out every year, do you go back and reassess, maybe we could do this differently, or we should do a higher dose, or uh, redo it? Do you have those experiences that you can recall saying, if we only knew this, now we know this, then we should redo that study? Philo philosophically, you want to kind of rethink based yeah, on Yeah, I, th I mean, I think any new... Well, first of all, whenever we start any new study, we always do a really extensive look at the literature to find right. out exactly what's been done before, right. so why it worked it, or right. why it didn't work. That's like you the, know the whole landscape. You yeah. have to start with that. And I um, always make sure that I've done that or my students or my staff have done that. So you've got to know the landscape first because you don't want to repeat something that's been done before. Mm. Um, it's actually quite rare that you go back and do the same study and it's absolutely vital that any clinical trial is clearly wanting to answer a new question. I mean, you're enrolling mm -hmm. people who are giving up their time, facing some risks by exposing them to drugs. It's a big effort. So, mm -hmm. um, 
we're very cautious and careful, and I think most clinical investigators are, that you're asking a really important question and a question that can be answered by the design of that study. And that's exactly what ethics committees look at when mm. they review your your um, application. They don't just look at, is this ethical to do? They actually ask, is this a, good, a, a reasonable question? Is this an important question to ask? Right. Because um, that is ethical research and you, can you we have, get the answer? Well, you, you have probably a lot of studies you'd like to do, but you say, okay, we have to figure out which one or which three of these because we can only do three out of the 20. Mm, and mm. You, is that a fair assessment? Of yeah, I mean, you not only have to get a great idea, you also have to get it funded first. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to um, get it through an ethics committee as well. So mm -hmm. it's got to pass all those hoops before you can do anything. Yeah. Well, it's really great to have you give this insight into research and the cure, which we hope for down the line. And we'll, have, we'll wait till it happens and then we'll, you know, see what, uh, how, and I don't know, we don't know what the cure is going to look like either. Exactly. We don't know whether it's going to be complicated or simple or cheap or expensive. I think, though, um, as a researcher, most, it's really important to think of where that cure is most needed and where it will end up. Mm -hmm. And um, It may be different for, we may have two versions of a cure and more applicable in in improving or in uh, needful countries as opposed to countries that we're on antivirals here and if it doesn't work and it's not but if there's something that is helpful for the developing countries it may be very different than what we might need in our in yeah, United States. Yeah, I think, diff I, think, I think whatever we develop um, is something worse. Like it has to be available for everyone but it may yeah. look different in different settings, yeah. exactly. You, you do what you have to do and even they were using breast milk for so long as an example, uh, and we'd never think of doing that here, but it, it made sense because it was safer, the safer way to go. Now they're still evaluating <coughs> that, mm. in fact, at this conference. So, yeah. uh, But it's it's always good to rethink that. Well, thank you so much for being here, and Pleasure. I appreciate your the energy, and I still don't know how you can look so alive <laughs> after a trip from Australia. Because I know when I go there, I always have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.